most recently was like weird it was like someone who was like in african your mean your name means like dog or something and i didn't know how to <laughs> take that <laughs> is it a good dog at least <laughs> good question <laughs> yeah it'd be fucked up if it was a bad like aja, aja right they could have just said dog and it might mean something <laughs> completely worse than just dog and they just want didn't want to offend me <laughs> they, they, yeah they could have been being nice yeah or yeah. like a server at a restaurant it could have been like waiting for a good tip yeah like, oh your name means this though mm-hmm. yeah I never. I have to do my research, so I don't just take people's word for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, there is Google, so we can do that. Now. <sighs> yeah, there is. Ah, fuck it. Oh, fuck it. Brought to you by me. Who this? I'm the bald guy. You know me by now. You see my face by now. If you don't, don't worry about it because I got a guest I'll make up for. Me not being that recognizable, besides being another bald. I look like a dirty thumbprint. I look like a, uh, you know, uh, agonized light bulb. You know, I, I, you know, like. Have uh, you ever been Avatar for Halloween? <laughs> I should be. I never <laughs> got into it, but you know, maybe I need to study up on the lore. To I feel like as it. long as you're bald, then you could just be Avatar. And just draw a big arrow <laughs> pointing down my head. It's the right, easiest like, costume. losing down here, pretty much. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Thank you so much to Asia, Adam. Yes, that's And right. also, you know, I would think your name is kind of unfair to anybody who's dyslexic. Because then they don't want to butcher the first part. Yeah. They don't want to be rude and assuming they know how to pronounce it. But then there's also the Adam, not Adams, as your last name as well. Only more recently were people concerned about offending people. So, <laughs> uh, as of recent, yeah. I've already, uh, I guess I've already gone through the, you know, the the people who just don't care and they'll just say whatever. And because I'm someone who, I'm usually not very confrontational. I kind of just let it rock unless it's someone that is like really close to me or I feel like I would like them to be saying my name correctly. Um, most you people are just so. like, I'm going to let it rock. Say Aja, say Aya. Well, Aha. <laughs> you already know. <laughs> like if someone made fun of your name and you've had your name your whole life, eventually the joke is not as funny. You've heard it enough times. Exactly. You're just like, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not that I take offense. As long as their intentions are good, it's not that I take offense to it. I'll just be, I can't authentically laugh at it, if that makes sense. You're beyond that at this point. Pretty much. Like, let's say Young maybe it, if yeah. you were going for a job interview and then that person made the joke, maybe like you, mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Witty. That yeah. sounds like the right reaction. I haven't heard that before. Right. Never. Ever. It's like, gee, did he just come up with that? <laughs> like, yeah. Should I be working for you or should you be working for an SNL? I right. don't know. Kind Honestly, of thing. <laughs> we're about to make a phone call. <laughs> but uh, I'm glad you're here today. It's been a while since I've been following you on Instagram. And I don't mean to come off voice sounding like that either. No, know? I mean, that's what it is. <laughs> God forbid I'm a man following a, an attractive <laughs> lady, woman, however you identify, you know. Be that, a woman, I get any of the words that go with female is fine with me. Th- yeah. There you go, as long as we're clear woman, on that. Even girl, sometimes because I feel like when you even this is kind of like getting a little deep, but when you're a kid and you go by girl or boy, unless you're aspiring to be like, oh, I just want to be like a woman or a man, mm-hmm. then like even when you get into 20s, like you still kind of feel like you're a girl. Like if somebody calls you a girl, you're not really gonna like react to it. Um, I don't know if that's the same with boys. There's that whole dynamic of like, you know. I never like sir, like, if that's you what you like mean. You don't like sir, interesting, no. okay. I've gotten sir for like at least the last 20 years of my life. Even when I had hair, I got sir. What do you think it is about sir that you don't like? It's implying I'm an old asshole or something. Maybe. We're just assuming. Are sirs usually assholes? No. Well, just, if, if I think they, it just means like an older or more mature man. Well, well, maybe the sirs that had the E at the end, like in, in mm, the old times. Sires. Sires, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I can see that. You know, down with the... Saya. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I'm sure they got fed up with that at some point, too. Because if Maybe. you've seen, um, if you remember from, the uh, what was it, last September, I think, uh, the Queen passed. Yes, right. And there was an outpour, but not like an outcry. They just showed up to be like, oh, you know, God bless the Queen. Or, God save the Queen. She's gone. Okay, great. Right. You know? She was up there, though. Yeah. No, she was up there. I mean, it was yeah. a matter of like, how do you get to be that old and live that long when really you're so... This is my opinion, of course. I don't mean mm-hmm. to, you know, drag you into this, no. but as far as the monarchy is concerned over there, even though I watched The Crown and I did enjoy it, it was a good watch. I haven't seen it yet, but I, I recommend should I it. add it? Okay. Yeah, add it to the watch definitely list. recommend it. Um, you know, they take a lot of liberties with like how sympathetic the queen came off being at some point. Mm. But I could see it, but then also it's like relax a little bit and how they like, I do like the history pieces when they focus on like certain events that happen, like the you know, yeah. throughout World War Did II. Did they romanticize it at all? Because I'm always concerned when, when people make shows or movies based on real life that they romanticize or like... Oh, how could they not? I mean, of course. Because yeah. then again, you got to think of, uh, are they going to sign off on it being, you know, aired yeah. if it's not like a little fluffed up for them? That makes Yeah. But that it's not it. like, it's not too much like too bad, 
But there is one really funny episode where they really prop up uh, Prince, not Charles, um, the dad. Um, no, I think it is Prince Charles. The one with the big ears, the one, King Charles, yeah. Okay. So back when he was Prince Younger, like, he's watching, like, the, um, everybody landing on the moon. And he's, like, so touched by it, too, because he was, like, a pilot, but he didn't mm. make it to be an astronaut. And he had to, like, settle for being, you know, royalty oh, yeah. instead. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. No, it wasn't King Charles. Sorry, Philip. Philip, his dad. Okay. I meant to say Philip. So he's the one that's like, oh, you know, oh, God damn it, I'm stuck being a pilot on Earth. I could have been one of them. I see. He's like watching with tears in his eyes. They land on the moon and shit. And like the whole build up to them, him finally meeting the astronauts, all of them. And yeah. he's like let down because they're all like commoners and they don't, they don't give a shit about landing on the moon. I wonder if that's based on how he really felt or if that was just for like emotional value, you know. I think that was kind of stretched out for that one episode, but it was a interestingly well done episode too. Okay. There's a lot of like little loops and plots to it. All right. So I recommend that one if you, you know, want to jump on the crown. All right. Shout out to the crown. Definitely. Shout out to the crown. <laughs> Down with the crown, but, you know, shout out to them still. Whatever yeah. remains of them. Then there's a whole mess with Harry and uh, Megan. I believe it. Yeah. They they keep getting made fun of and they want to file police reports every time Southport makes a reference to them. If you've seen The Simpsons did one. No. Uh, Family Guy did one to them last week. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I'm pretty on top of Family Guy, but I have to go rewatch it. It's one of the more recent ones, obviously, but yeah, yeah, yeah. they wanted to practically like call in a SWAT team on them for like making fun of them. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and it's like the second time too. Sad part did it better, honestly, but still. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Yeah, definitely. Love Family Guy, by the way. Still love it. Yeah, I was watching it before I was of age to watch it. <laughs> Do you remember when they were like, "Must be advised if you're under 14 or whatever"? They would have it on the TV. I don't even day. remember that part. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, back in the di- back when it was on TV more than like stream before streaming and stuff. Oh, it okay, was, okay. It would say like if you're under 14, like adult supervision advised or something like that. But I would be watching it with with my older sister and yeah, <laughs> so that was a good time. Nice. Wish yeah. I was a Family Guy, but um, I don't know. Kind of like The Simpsons, it's kind of hard to not fall off at a certain point when you go on too long. Yeah, I guess it depends on where you are in your life. Like maybe because I was a kid and I had like more time on my hands at the time to just watch it after school or whatever. It it felt like I could just watch it whenever and I would watch episodes over and over again and not get tired of it. So Mm. it was one of those things It felt emotional connection. Not emotional because it's family guy, but childhood connection or something yeah because that your family uh, family guy to you was like simpsons to like people my age most likely and i did watch simpsons as a kid but it felt like a show that like had already been going so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so it, like the novelty worn out after a certain point in a way i mean i was still like i was still a kid who liked all like the kitty jokes of like oh this homer guy is like ridiculous and <laughs> you know loves donuts and getting drunk and stuff did you see the thing now that came out where um i don't think they officially announced it on the show but like they like put it on the paper article something like um homer will no longer choke out bart because it's wrong to do and that was annoying. like the one running gag they still had left that was funny that's that's crazy <laughs> <laughs> people are funny <laughs> they did enough with our poo but yeah you can't yeah Simpsons gonna get canceled one. because the homer's choking bart and like <laughs> kids are d- that did not i don't think i'm not gonna speak for the whole world but i don't think that that has affected a lot of families in the sense of like no. oh man now all these fathers are going to be choking their sons like <laughs> no. what a tragedy no if anything they were just like touching on something that was going on at that time when they were out already right and that's what comedy does really well is it t- touches on the the things that are real but makes it a space that we're like comfortable to watch it and enjoy it and still be like i know that's wrong but because it's a cartoon this is fake yeah. I'll laugh, you know. Obviously, don't do it in real life. Right. And, and shout out to not supporting child abuse, of course, obviously. We love it. We love not to, not abusing children. <laughs> Never ever, please. You could tell that I don't have children <laughs> by the way that I talk about children. <laughs> but speaking of children, I guess you could say, in your case, your music is like a child. Because I did find, while I was doing my research on you, to be properly informed on who Asia Adam. I'm going to really... I'm going to pause sometimes saying it just because I want to make sure I get it right. If I don't, then just You've feel free You've gotten it every to, single time. Uh, well, that's me mentally taking a break to make sure <laughs> I do so. But, um, yeah, your music seems to be like a child based off all the reading I did on you, all the notes I took. But, of course, let's be proper. Introduce ourselves to you. Or you introduce yourselves to us. Okay. Either way, it's a fair exchange. But I like to start with at least a name because it's not even Asia like the cotton it's spelled it. A S I A. I have to look at that to make sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. You so it. yours is spelled A J A. Yeah. Your last name is Adam, 
no Adams, no relation right. to, you know, the mayor. Yeah, that's a common thing also that I have to, like, stop people at sometimes, <laughs> being Adam, no S. Which I, I, I will think is hard enough to do because it's so common to, with the S of and course, then Adam. Adam's family is a common show, so mm-hmm. everyone's going to say Adams. But then on top of that, too, I believe your middle name is Eden as well. Yeah. And that stems from actually what I read about your parents, yeah. which, you know, feel free to correct me mm-hmm. if at any point I get anything wrong. Um, your mom wa- is Jamaican and Bermudan yep. uh, origin. Yes. Your dad is Israeli. Yes. And a music buff kind of fanatic pretty For much, sure. right? For sure. But he never touched on music or got into it himself. Not like professionally. Like he used to love playing the saxophone. This is before he had kids. He would love playing the saxophone just for himself, just playing in the house over like, you know, he loves um, the instrumental version of My Favorite Things. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just, you know, he he loves jazz music. He loves a lot of music. But yeah, saxophone was a big thing for him. Nice. So he never took up an instrument of his own per se or like. Like I said, it, it wasn't in a professional sense. Like he. Like, I've seen him play drums before, like, at the house. I remember at one point we had, like, a... It wasn't an official drum set. It was, like, one of the quieter ones so that the neighbors don't go crazy if you're playing drums. Mm. Um, so I've seen him play drums before, and, you know, he's he's decent at it. Um, like I said, saxophone. I can't, I'm trying to think of other instruments. But, yeah, I would say he's... I guess he does play. It's just not, like... He's never performed on stage from what I know. So was he one of those, like, like kind of picks it up by playing by ear kind of thing? Maybe, yeah. I mean, he never, from my understanding, he never studied music at school, Mm -hmm. unless there's something he hasn't told me from his, like, elementary school days or something. Um, But he's always just loved music. And I think sometimes that's the best way to get into something you're passionate about is just genuine, like, interest in it. Mm. It doesn't have to be, oh, I studied this in school and now I, you know, I work with these people and... it. Sometimes when your, your job becomes your passion, not all the time, but sometimes, it can be more robotic and you don't have the love for it in the way that you used to. Mm. So would that explain, I guess, well, I'll take a guess and again, correct me if I'm wrong. Since he was the music fan and your mom was an established actress, I, I read through mm-hmm. what she's done and she's a, like she's a also career's concern. musical theater as well. So she too has her own music interests, but they're very mm. different. I would say my mom and my dad. So that, let's say that your dad put your mom onto different sounds and stuff. I would say so. Yeah. Um, being that they divorced when I was like five years old, I don't, mm. I've, I don't have much memories of them together and what they would do together ah. other than stories that they've told me after the fact. But I can imagine be, just knowing their influences as individuals that mm. when they were together, there was a lot of learning new things and understanding new things. So with your dad being the obvious fan of music as he was, as diverse as he got into mm-hmm. all the genres, it seems like. Mm-hmm. Is he the one that named you Asia after the Steel Dan song and yeah. album? Yes. yes. Okay. And it's interesting. My last name, his last name, he was not his last name when he was in Israel. He changed his name when he came to America. Mm-hmm. So my name, sometimes I think about how my name is not, it doesn't have as much roots as a lot of people. You know how like a lot of families, they carry the last name generation after generation after generation. And I feel like, I don't necessarily know why, but he started a new, like, time with with changing his name um, that I feel like, you know, in my future, or, like, you know, I have a brother, so I'm sure that if and when he were to get married and, like, his kids could be last name Adam, it's like my dad started this new bloodline in a way. I mm. kind of, like, think about it like that. Okay. Um, but, yeah, so my name feels very new. Otherwise, my last name would be Cohen. That would be a different life. Yeah. Asia Eden Cohen. It doesn't no, have a bad ring to it. It's not bad. No. It'd be different, though. I really like the double A, like a double A battery. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well, yeah, thank, thank you to the Dealey. Uh, uh, thank, yeah. thank you to the Steely Dan song. Uh, I was able to get the name right because this whole time I was going to make a dad joke level kind of thing. Cringe, okay. probably. Which would be your appropriate. Name. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Thanks. <laughs> um. I was going to say, at least in my head, I was pronouncing Aja. Okay. But I was thinking more of the sense like, oh, um, you know, like uh, in Spanish, say Aja, Aya, over mm-hmm. there kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I, w- I would think, you know, point over there, that would be like Aja, Aya. I wouldn't be mad at it. <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. Or like a very, um, like how the Spaniards pronounce their Spanish, like Aja. I mm. thought it would have been more like that. I don't think I've heard that pronunciation yet. That's interesting. But that Asha, definitely would have been like a Castilian-style tongue uh, um, enunciating your name, Asha. Interesting. 
Yeah, I would. I could see myself if I were to travel more, which I haven't like traveled to a whole lot of countries yet. I, I would be interested interested to hear how people pronounce my name in different like accents and stuff like that. That is a good point. You know, when you start doing world tours and stuff, yeah, it'd be crazy to see. Well, they'll know your name by now. It'll be established by mm-hmm. then. But then it would be like if you run into the random stranger who doesn't, then to yeah. see how they like kind of like go to India and see how they say it, and then like Africa how they say it, like how they try to meld your name together in their mind before they even say a letter, like mm-hmm. nah. yeah, yeah. But it's interesting the the power of like American culture is so strong that sometimes people already know how you say your name because like you know media and all that. So I feel like it wouldn't be as effective unless like it's the older people who are like, well, you may not know, but your name when you know your name in my language sounds like this or means this or whatever there mm. have been a couple of people who've told me that most recently it was like weird it was like someone was like in african your mean your name means like dog or something and i didn't <laughs> know how to <laughs> take that <laughs> is it a good dog at least <laughs> good question <laughs> yeah it'd be fucked up if it was a bad like aja, aja. right they could have just said dog and it might mean <laughs> something completely worse than just dog and they just want didn't want to offend me <laughs> they, they, yeah they could have been being nice yeah. Or yeah. like a server at a restaurant, it could have been like waiting for a good tip. Yeah. Like, oh, your name means this, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I never. I have to do my research, so I don't just take people's word for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, there is Google, so we can do that now. Uh, yeah, there is. It's really gotten... And the translation with the Google thing is kind of right. scary good. Depending yeah. on the dialect, too, but, you know. Yeah. It's pretty, you know, on the nose, I'd say. I think there's even ways for Siri to... For you to change how Siri pronounces things. So, like, if you want her to say your name correctly, then she might be able to do that oh really yeah do you have you ever had issues with like you know phones or technology mispronouncing your name uh to be honest i don't think i have or i've noticed i would think you would potentially yeah i have yet to hear it correctly (laughs) so what's what have you gotten so far that's even like i wonder if i could find it right now that would be kind of funny um let me see so if i go to google translate once i find the app um it will it will find a way to to mess up my name because that's what my name is for it's for messing up <laughs> <laughs> well i did want to touch back on the steely dan part because well you know i'm not that big a fan this is the first time i ever really sat down and listened to a full-on steely dan song i'm guilty of that okay besides uh you may have even heard it like from a radio and you just didn't know maybe i have but uh, just this is before you know shazam or any of those like, right, right right those songs that kind of get lost in memory you know over time yeah, that's true. But, uh, I mean, besides uh, Kid Charlemagne, I think, that was the only other song I, li- I ever listened to because Kanye sampled that one for oh, uh Kanye sampled uh, the Steely Dan song? Yeah. Oh, that song. Oh, mm-hmm. that is... I don't think I've heard the original yet. I know the song Champion, but I don't think I've heard the Steely Dan one yet. It's one of those kind of literally he plucked it from the song and just dropped it in, but it, yeah. it played well. Okay. It's old Kanye, so, you know, it plays well. Yeah, I know that. Old Kanye is... I mean, old Kanye has its its good, you know. But I think I listened to more old Kanye. Mm-hmm. It was, I don't know how to explain it. Of course, there's the, like I said before, childhood connection of yeah. it. Um, but I, I feel like maybe it just aged well, like his old music. Because oh, you yeah. hear it now and you're like, this is still going on. This is still relevant, you know. So it's interesting to hear how it's aged over time. Compared to the newest stuff, which isn't bad, but it's like it's got a time and place. Yeah, sort of. I, it could be more, per- like his music more is more personal now. I feel like there's a lot of personal growth that he's doing. And in the beginning, I'm sure there was also personal growth, but he was also a voice for everybody else in a way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm trying to have Google Translate say my name, but... Um, not cooperating. The sound is just not. Isia. What? <laughs> I don't even Isia. Know. I don't even know. But this is English to French, so maybe that's what it is. That's how it's. That's how they would say it in French. I guess. Okay, let's try English. Isia. Asia. Oh, there you go. She said it right. <laughs> <laughs> so excited. <laughs> and she even said it kind of like more to the style of your name, not just Asia. Yeah, yeah, wow. I'm I'm a little impressed. Shout, okay. out, shout to Google. <laughs> so you've been listening all this time now. Literally. It's like, okay, we get it after 27 <laughs> years. <laughs> I'm not even the only Asia. Imagine all the other Asians in the world. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did see that, actually, looking you up. There was more. There's some so. other Asians. Well, I guess that song was popular, and it looks like, because it was from one of the best-selling albums from Steely mm-hmm. Dan, at least. So I don't know if you know this or if you ever gone back to that song or album specifically to give it a good listen or be like, hmm, what made my dad potentially I don't think me? I heard the full album. I've heard some songs off of it. Yeah. But definitely at least the title track, Asia. Mm-hmm. Uh, Asia, sorry. They, see, yeah. 
Asia, I know like front to back. Okay. Even though half of it is like instrumental, but yeah. So then I guess I would like to ask you if based off Steely Dan, how well your knowledge is on them, if you knew- Very low. Either of these, which you, okay, we probably won't know then, <laughs> but based on the song Asia. Yeah. That was actually named after a Korean woman who married the brother of one of the guys, I believe, In yeah, Donald Fagan. Okay. The lead guys. Okay. And I didn't know, but if you look at the cover art of the the album. That has like a tie or something, right? Like a red and white. I didn't know that was a woman, actually. I didn't know that either. Wow. Because the, the top part looks like something else or like the, the top knot of a tie. But it's actually like a side profile shot of a woman. Wow. I forget the name of the model. I didn't write that down, but it's of uh, a model. I gotta look at that again now. Profile wow. shot and like, yeah. That's incredible. Wow. Those really artsy like 70 music album covers. So Yeah, they were very creative at yeah. that time. But that's, I feel like, a lot of music at the time. Well, for one, the music during, like, 60s and 70s was more political, obviously reflecting the world and stuff. Um, but, yeah, they were also just more creative and, like, um, experimental, I feel, both with music and every other art form that was happening at the time. I guess I'll ask you that now, since um, you've been more selective of what you release of your own work. You have you let time pass. You let it breathe, per se. Yeah. Do you think, uh, at least I feel like back when with music, even up until like the 2000s early, mm -hmm. there was enough time to like let it all sink in and absorb and appreciate it, good or bad, versus nowadays now it's like anybody with a computer, this and that can just put out like a whole album in a day if they feel like it, but yeah. with no effort. Yeah, I or think that um, it takes time to create things that are great and things that last. Um, the other day my dad was showing me like a Jay-Z documentary and... His first album was like a lot of years in the making, like I think they said something like 26 years in the making or something like that. And so it's interesting to think about how the value of music, I just feel like the value of music has diminished now because yeah. everything is so like, I need it right now. Like the, the people need it right now or they say they do, you know. Um, and so I'm, I want to take pride in taking my time with things so that they will last and that they will sink in with people. And also I'm not going to write a song that doesn't have a lot of meaning just because I can put it out quickly or I can produce it quickly. Yeah, exactly. You know? So, I mean, that's with everything. That's if you're cooking a meal, if you want it to taste really good, it's going to take a little longer, you know? Um, so. Yeah, only with like muscle memory after time does it come out quicker. Exactly. You're kind of like used to it, like the back of your hand almost. But yeah, right. nowadays it's like really no compromise, no like real uh, attachment yeah, and I feel like I apply that to a lot of things in my life. Like, I'm, it's probably going to be a while until I learn how to use an air fryer because I'm, I'm like, it seems too easy. <laughs> like, I need to be cooking. And it needs to take a long time, and I need to struggle. <laughs> you know what I hate, though, is now they do the recipes on, like, IG or TikTok, mm -hmm. and they do it all for, oh, uh, this time, this degree for the air fryer. Yeah. Give me the goddamn oven. Exactly. I still use that. And then you have to go online and be like, oh, uh, take off 10 minutes from the air fryer. No, add on 10 minutes if you use the oven versus the air fryer conversion rates. Like, I have enough... You know, trouble having a, a my, my, my Russian girlfriend, she still thinks of like milliliters and centimeters and shit. Oof, different. Yeah. So yeah, I still got to figure that out. Think, do the conversion <laughs> the in my head. are funny because I just feel like America wanted to do its own thing. And now like, ev like, I don't know, we make it seem like we're the right ones. <laughs> and like everybody else in the world is like, I don't, I don't know what they're doing. Like they just got their own thing. It is on. odd though, right? Just the measurements, just that one little. Yeah. You know, measurements and like, you know, like Fahrenheit and Celsius and all that. Like That too. I wish I was more. Uh, I wish I knew Celsius better because I feel like the rest of the world <laughs> just knows the deal. And America's like, what if we just didn't? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, screw whatever y'all are doing. I fucking communicate terribly. Are you hungry? No. No. Are you not Burger King? Did you get something for me? No. I didn't. As a matter of fact. Why? Because right before I left, I asked you if you're hungry. What'd you say? <laughs> What'd you say? You didn't say where you were going. It does not matter. That has no effect on your answer. Are you hungry? And also, another little fun fact about Steely Dan. Yeah. The name, the origin of at least. Quote, the name is taken from a strap-on dildo named Steely Dan 3 from Yokohama that was mentioned in William S. Burroughs' novel Naked Lunch. <laughs> I actually found about I uh, found out about that from um I don't know if you've heard it or if you're familiar with Prince Paul, the producer. No. Uh he helped make the first three De La Soul albums. Oh, wow. 
and he's gone on to do other things, great things. Shout out to him. I'd, I'd love to work with him one day. Mm. But he did a podcast for this book series called 33 and the Third. Okay. Which would reflect on like old classic albums, like little mini, like this thin books. Mm-hmm. There's one for like Kanye's uh, Dark Fantasy. There's another one for Kendrick. I, forget, I forget which one. I think Butterfly. Okay. But they did one for Steely Dan Aja. Asia. Okay. Asia. I mean. That's okay. <laughs> Steely Dan Asia. Yeah, yeah. And they did a podcast episode about the book. And Prince Paul was the one that found that fact out. Wow. <laughs> Digging up the name. Oh, oh, how'd you come up with that name? And I think it was with uh, Pasta News from De La Soul. Okay. That's funny. Wow. I didn't know that fact. Yeah. So that, they're the one that dug up that little fact I heard. And it's like, wait a minute. It can't be. Then I looked it up online. It's like, oh, shit. And even the guy confirmed himself in like a TV special and then like in some interview article from what magazine like yeah it was a dildo now i have to have the awkward conversation with my dad <laughs> dad <laughs> did you know this <laughs> like how were you gonna tell me <laughs> how were you into mom at that time when you thought of that damn it oh my god <laughs> i kind of hope i meet like one of the stealing mem- dan members before they you know their time so yeah you did this to me you gave me this name which yeah has this affiliation what do you have to now this phallus <laughs> <laughs> oh man but that's Steely Dan. What I other mean, facts you got? <laughs> those are two that stuck out to me. So I, I figured that's enough with knowing that your name, unfortunately, is associated that's with That's enough for me to do research on that I should have done by now. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely should have. Well, at least you could bring it up to Dad now with the, you know, holidays, pick one, Thanksgiving or Christmas. Oh, yeah. Like, hey, Dad, by the way, um, explain. Right. <laughs> with, with everyone around. <laughs> Well, we'll do a Zoom Thanksgiving. And then. As you cut the, as you <laughs> hack the leg off the turkey. Hey, Dad, um, does this remind you of something when you <laughs> came time around naming me by any chance from a group that decided to do this too? Right. Any of this seem familiar? <laughs> <laughs> around 1996, did you know? <laughs> I guess it would be 95 if you're thinking about when I was conceived. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> process and time making of. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm staying up extra late tonight to see a test train pull into Brighton Station. One of my favourite locomotives might be on it, so we'll just have to wait and see. <sighs> the 73962! Oh, it's it! It's it! <sighs> oh, quick, I've got to get round. I've got to get round to see it. This is beautiful 73962. Dick my butt. What a beautiful locomotive she is. We have yet to touch on what even got you into music to begin with, which I, I, we can kind of gather that from, you know, again, your mother being an actress and your dad being a big music buff. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he put you on over time to like different sounds and artists, genres. So you've had you and your brother and sister, I believe, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You've all had kind of like the, um, the gamut to run through as far as like sounds, you recognize as you grew up and such. Yep. Did, did anything stick out to you from like an early age as far as genres or sounds or artists are concerned at all that you kind of like, maybe not mirror yourself after, but kind of like took to at least early on? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if this is necessarily genres, but I was always fascinated by writing and storytelling in music. Um, I, I feel like I always gravitated towards music that was telling a story and, um, like, you know, it's funny that we were talking about Avril Lavigne a second ago. Um, yeah. She was a big... Shout out to Avril. Yeah, for sure. And people would really guess that that's one of my inspirations, I feel. Mm-hmm. I should definitely have this on silent. I'm very <laughs> unprofessional. Um, people wouldn't gather that she's someone that I'm very inspired by uh, as a writer. But mm-hmm. she was very raw and vulnerable in her music. Even though most people just know, like, Complicated and Skater Boy. Um, <laughs> she had a lot of... She had other hits. Yeah, she had... Even if it wasn't hits, but just, like, other songs on her even albums. Deep like. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, when I was a kid, I, I had a friend who was, she was definitely a fan of Avril and I feel like put me onto a lot of the music that wasn't, you know, on MTV or whatever. And um, yeah, she just, she spoke on, from a young age, I'll say, but, you know, her experiences with relationships and how she felt about them and her feelings of wanting to run away sometimes, you know, when she didn't feel understood or whatever. And so, not to be the the brat that <laughs> that I would be to to say that I associate with that at a young age, but I felt a connection to those feelings at least of just feeling like you didn't belong sometimes or you wanted to escape, um, you just want to feel good, and so I feel like a lot of those writings played a role in how I developed my music was just to be as vulnerable as possible, and not only that, but to know that other people are listening and they feel that connection. Mm. 
because um, from what I read too, growing up, you actually wanted to be three things, either a doctor, a teacher, and or a singer, or did you want to be all three? I didn't know at the time. I just, I don't know what it was about those three <laughs> things, but I definitely liked, you know, a good amount of my teachers, like in elementary school. Like I, I just, even today I admire learning from people. And I think that's just my, my dad is someone that I learned a lot from because he knew a lot. He had a lot of knowledge. Um, and so like whenever I meet people, whether it's been from friendships or relationships or whatever, I always mm-hmm. feel like I want to learn something from a person. Um, and I ho- and I love growing with that. And I, I don't know what the doctor thing was, but I guess when you go to a doctor that you trust, which unfortunately not all of us have that experience, but nope. when you do, <laughs> he's like, I know that. I'm Spanish. We don't. <laughs> Never. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess speaking from a child ex- um, perspective, because it's not as much now, like now I'm more about like natural medication and like mm. doing as much as you can naturally than like trying to rely on, you know, drugs and things like that. Like holistic and stuff or? Um, not really. I'm just like, I like, you know, shea butter and black soap and things like that. Like, um, I'm I not keep someone... hearing about shea butter. Can you elaborate on what shea butter does for one i guess shea butter i would say is it heals the skin better like it really repairs the skin um it's not just a temporary like you know how when you put on like typical lotion from the drugstore that it just it lasts for like 15 minutes and then it's like you never put it on you wasted your money yeah. so shea butter is like you'll you'll feel how thick it is and it's gonna last you like for a very you know long time hmm. um and so yeah i just feel like i've noticed that when i use shea butter i feel like so it's going to sound corny, but my skin feels stronger, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I would recommend it. You can give it a shot. I, it is, it's is—it's—it's like the yellow stuff. I don't know if you've seen it before. Is that the one that's grainy to the touch, like sa- uh, sandy almost? Not as much sandy. I mean, it. I wouldn't describe it as a cream either. It's not as, like, you know, light as a cream. Mm. I don't know what to compare it to. Maybe, like, clay, kind Is it, of? like, cocoa butter-ish? Or? Cocoa butter, yeah. It's, like, in that same family, I would say. Mm. Yeah, either so any of those butters I think are good for you cocoa butter, shea butter, other oils and things like that. Well, shout out to all natural butters and oils. I need that as you can see on my face. I've been taken apart and clawed away at it by time. You got clear skin. Crow feet. A lot of a lot of men just know how to have clear skin. It it might be the makeup factor that women, you know, put on a lot of makeup, but (laughs) I feel like I recently got into putting soap like on my face Mm -hmm. and like Wait, you weren't before? Because I was scared of getting in my eyes. So I would still do facial cleansers. Like facial cleansers is like, I guess it's like a soap. Oh, not full on soap. Like the not actual bar soap stuff or something. Or... Okay. Yeah. But because I started using black soap and I was like, this is obviously doing wonders for the rest of my skin. What's I... wrong with white soap? <laughs> That's a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see it at the store. <laughs> um, or in separate sections at least. Yeah. Oh yeah. Of course they have yeah. to. That's the only way to keep the peace. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, black soap is very is also like healing and repairing of the skin. Mm. I might need to start using this black soap. I've been using the white soap. It's been doing nothing for me, not much at least. No surprise. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> <kidding>. right, <yeah. laughs> I kind of resemble it too, so I need a tan. <laughs> hey, I mean, I'm I'm technically half black, half white. So although I feel weird about the half thing, because mm. I don't know how to explain it, but I feel like you can't really be half of anything. Like, mm. your blood is fully con- consisting of the things that you are. Even if you're biracial, like, you can be fully black and fully white at the same time. You know, I was reading into that. I'm sorry, not reading into that. I was watching that mm-hmm. based off this, uh, I forget his name on YouTube, this one guy who does, like, he's Japanese and does all videos uh, in, um, interviewing tourists or foreigners, as he calls them. Uh, but he tries to focus more on biracial people that are like half Japanese, half something else. Mm-hmm. And it is crazy because now I'm just seeing that over there, at least in Japan, they really kind of look down or frown upon anyone who's half or mm-hmm. not fully Japanese. Okay. Regardless of what the other half is, even mm-hmm. though he's already said himself and other people allude to it too, like, oh, they really... um like lay out the red carpet for like the white Anglo looking person, but once they're half, then it's like yeah. nope, stay away. Yeah. Or they're I'm nice. I'm wondering if first. they have a reason for it because there's a psychology behind it that even Spike Lee has alluded to in some of his films. Of you know, the, I think he made a 
I don't know if it was a joke, but it was like the way that they said it in the movie Jungle Fever, mm -hmm. um, that they were saying like, you know, all these these mixed kids are just all mixed up and they don't, you know, they're confused basically. And I mean, I can see that and I can kind of see myself in that where it's like you feel like you're stuck between two worlds sometimes. And, you know, if they're the cultures are just so different, I, I can only mm -hmm. imagine like people who get into bi not bi biracial marriages, but whatever you would call um, in what, what's the phrase? interracial marriages <laughs> over here like forgetting words um people who get into interracial marriages i feel like that's always a tough unless like the grandparents happen to be more liberal about it mm. it's always a tough um integration of cultures because what we're not even like what 50 something years removed from that being illegal oh yeah what, what year did that become legal uh i want to say 70 something okay i mean that that sounds right when i think about the politics at that time that makes sense probably yeah give or take like 60s or 70s i mean martin luther king was 60s so if you think about from that point yeah probably around then i, I was never good at history <laughs> <laughs> just ironic i forget the bit. more i get older so it's all right we're in the same boat yeah <laughs> um but yeah i think it's it can be a difficult conversation for it, i guess it's just the perspective of like you knew one thing for so long or followed a certain culture for so long that to like let in this different culture it can be a challenge mm -hmm. um i mean at the same time it's like people are people you know what i mean like, it's definitely gatekeeping which is surprising because you always or at least i've always heard about or learned that oh you know japanese are so polite they're so welcoming and such but then he's like okay they are welcoming they'll welcome you in like a like you're a new neighbor, yeah. welcome to town, here's a tree of cookies and stuff. But then once mm -hmm. it goes beyond, oh, can you move your trash off my side of the block? It's like, no, yeah. I don't know who you are. Kind of when thing. it becomes personal, when, it, when yeah. it's in the home, it's, it's a yeah. whole different thing. That's out the question, reason. right. Yeah. Yeah, I guess because of my upbringing, I don't think I could ever be someone who, you know, doesn't accept someone based on ethnicity or anything like that. Because, I don't know, we're just old people. Um, I feel like a lot of people who are biracial, not to say only, but I just, I feel like a lot of people who are bi biracial from a young age understand that we really are, are all just people, mm -hmm. um, and culture and stuff like that shouldn't separate us. I mean, we can all have different morals and things that we believe in and things like that. And you're allowed to agree or disagree, but yeah, I just, I don't know how people do like, I'm never going to treat somebody differently because of their ethnic origin or based on um who they like and you know things like that um yeah i don't know it's just i'm from new york so <laughs> it's like we see everything <laughs> yeah. a little bit of everything that's the beautiful part yeah just diversity yeah the good and the bad the good and the bad <laughs> you gotta take the good with the bad though just you're right take the new york train i feel like anyone who's not from new york or even america just take a new york subway and you'll you'll get an idea of what new york's all about you see the highs and the lows well classes and all that yes but you also got to be careful where you recommend they take the train, too, as well. Because there are still the sketchy parts I don't even want to be in. Yeah. You don't want to be in. But if it's strictly for the sake of research. Yeah. And just, like, I wonder what, you know, the levels of New York is like, you know, like, the rich and the poor. Mm. We're all in the same space unless, you know, they have a car. But you really shouldn't have a car in New York. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you really see everything in one space when you're in a New York subway car. It's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Everything short of a stabbing or any sort of crime, yeah. Yeah. I'm fine with that. Pizza rat, okay. Mm -hmm. you know, I'll wave high, but then beyond that, no, I, I need to run. Right, yeah. So as far as diversity is concerned and you being a product of a biracial relationship, I read that you also felt that of the things you kind of wanted to explore from a young age, and you did eventually, you know, being an artist as you are, creative, and then um, you actually went to school for photography for a year at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The School of Visual Arts. Yes. But it was around that time you kind of were told or it was proven to you that your music was your true love. So you had to kind of tear away from that and finally yeah. commit. Yeah. I I wouldn't say I was told, but it was just kind of, it felt like I was even in a space where I was like doing photography and being around other people doing photography and learning photography, I really wanted to do the music more. Um, it kind of showed me, I feel like sometimes you can see the things you really want to do 
um when you know like let's say you're doing a job that maybe you don't really like but it's paying the bills or whatever what you choose to do with your off time shows who you are and who what you really want to be doing with your time um even if it's just watching tv clearly you're someone who just likes to watch tv on your free time that's cool um with me it was music with me it was like learning what i could do with production learning new chords on on the guitar um trying to understand harmonizing and like what my voice can sound like the ranges of my voice like mm-hmm. that was stuff i like to do on my own time i love to like figure out harmonies when i'm listening to a song i'm trying to like figure out a cool harmony either whether it's like the obvious one or something that maybe wouldn't be expected like that's something that i just like to do when i'm hearing a song and so i think the things that you do when you're not really thinking about it and you're just like that's your free time that says a lot about what you really want from life which is funny because um are you mostly self-taught by any chance with um everything you do music wise or i guess it's 50 50 like there was a lot of things that i picked up on from listening to music but also i did i was usually in some sort of music program even in like elementary school Mm, okay and did your dad play any part in that either um like did you learn from him did he kind of pass along any knowledge he never actually really taught me music like theory or anything like that i mean some like he would always be like playing rhythms like on when when his stomach was like bigger <laughs> like he would just be playing drums like to music but he was never um like consciously teaching me music he would mm-hmm. just he would be playing music he would be playing like a doc he would show us a documentary about a musician or showing us a movie that had important music in it like a, you know I've, spike lee was very um played a I would say that Spike Lee was very connected with the music that he put into his films. I mean, he was connected with everything about his films, but um, I feel like he was very intentional about who he had playing like as the soundtrack of his movies. Yeah, because it was interesting. I read that you actually got into the LaGuardia High School of Music and Arts and Performing Arts from one audition. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't think I had a callback. Yeah, just that one audition I got in. They just took you right in as soon as they heard you. I mean, you know, it took however many days, I'm sure, or weeks. I don't uh, come on, don't be humble. Come on. But they took you in. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, it was between that school and another school called Repertory, mm-hmm. which um, was in Midtown. And it was a much smaller school. And I was kind of, I got into both of those schools, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do because one is like a big school that is clearly like a big deal. And, you know, I, I knew that it was going to be like just a lot of people and a lot to pay attention to. And I knew that as a student, I needed like more attention and I needed more like, I knew I was going to ask questions and kind of need things to go slower. So I was like, maybe if I go to a smaller school, then I'll kind of have that attention and I'll be able to like, I don't think I was thinking about it as deeply, but I I thought I would grow more if I had more of that attention in a smaller space. Mm. Um, But I think in the end, I chose LaGuardia just because I was like, I guess it was one of those like why not things like maybe I should just go for it. I, I felt like sometimes I was the type of person to do what was safe um, and do what was comfortable. And I kind of just wanted, I, I didn't want to be that person who just settles for safe and comfortable. And so mm. jumped in. Which is interesting because of all things you went to that high school and reading more upon you, you said it ended up being nothing like the grassy, which you were a fan of, to your surprise. But I was thinking, too, uh, high school was hard enough for us regular folks, not talented like you are, of course. But You're doing this. This takes talent for sure. Ah, you know. Thank you for that. It I appreciate does. it. Yeah. But, but uh, I, I just got stuff to get off my, my chest and my mind most times. So, you know, when I bring a guest in, it's to be polite and formal with this. Format. Not everybody is good at, at getting things off their chest, so it takes a lot. <laughs> well, beats therapy, so. <laughs> Save Cheaper, money. at least. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm investing in myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> My brother was showing me a video the other day of like somebody who they went to a comedy show. I forgot who the comedian. I forgot his name. I think it was Chris Red or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and so one of the audience members is like reacting to something he said. Like he was like, I, I forgot what he said, but he was like, "Do you ever notice that this, that, and the other?" And she was like loudly responding as if the conversation oh, was just those. for her. Yeah. And uh, my my brother sent that to me, and I responded. And I was like, "She couldn't afford therapy, so <laughs> she let it all out at a comedy show. <laughs> the things we'll do to save money." <laughs> and they're always the ones that go, "Yes, woo!" Right. Woo everything. Although talking about a personal experience, it's like, well, we didn't ask 
we're not here we didn't pay money to <laughs> see you <laughs> or the thing is too a lot of crowd work clips a lot of comedians put up is like no one can ever give a straight answer anymore like, right what yeah. do you do for a living oh you know i think i'm a engineer of some sorts but you know that's on the weekends but my heart <laughs> is really in something else entirely uh-huh. yeah yeah i do notice that that's funny it's perfect for them it, it's kind of like a softball and they're going in you know yeah. wow, you know you could just answer that asshole or something like that i guess that's a, that's the incentive to go to the show yourself so you can see what's really like Everybody needs a spotlight, I guess, nowadays. Dave's in opposition. Anita Dick is an opponent. Waves in opposition. Holden Hiscock is also an opponent. But going back to uh, LaGuardia, the school you went to, mm-hmm. the high school, excuse me, you mm-hmm. went to, do you think in comparison, obviously it wasn't like the grassy, anything like it, like you said yourself, Yeah. but do you think being in an artsy i guess to informally to say it like that yeah, accurate sort of high school do you think it would have it, it was more competitive amongst yourselves since everybody's looking for their kind of moment in the spotlight depending on what they're focusing on it definitely was and and i i tried not to really get into that competitive stuff because i was more focused on like wanting friends pretty much um i wanted to just find a circle that i felt like i fit into and was comfortable with and we could just you know I feel like for the most part, I wanted to have fun. Um, and I wasn't as, I wasn't like jumping toward the major um, programs and stuff in that school. Um, you know, they had certain programs where it was like they would really focus on your writing as, as yourself as an artist, as opposed to, oh, I'm just going to chorus because it's like in my schedule. Mm-hmm. So I was more so just following my schedule and kind of taking the more basic route for the most part. But I still, I would say around, when I was 16 or 17, I would like write songs on my own, just like, you know, to myself. Um, and I think you said that's where you started getting more into poetry, right? And that yeah. helped you kind of delve into that more? Yeah, I was always, um, along with like, like I said, storytelling, poetry was always something that I felt like I wanted to incorporate in my music. It almost feels like it's needed for a song that you want to hit people with. Um, I feel like a lot of music like that lacks poetry. And I feel, I don't know how I sound saying that, but <laughs> where's the poetry? Where's the soul? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, which is definitely how I got into R&B and soul. That is very poetic, both musically and lyrically. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely got into poetry and like understanding structures of music. Um, even understand, kind of like treating a song like a movie, like, how do we introduce what's about to happen and like the trials and tribulations of what's going on in the song. Um, and even kind of just like giving little bits throughout the song. So it's not like I'm just throwing everything in the beginning and then it's like, we have nothing to look forward to. So Mm. really creating a psychology behind music is something that I feel like I did on my own time and songwriting. I never learned in school. And Mm. yet I feel like that's something that people gravitate towards the most with my music is the writing. So you went in as a vocal major, right? Mm -hmm. What does that encompass as far as like your curriculum? Um, chorus for sure. Be like a chorus of a hundred people or something, <laughs> <laughs> all in a room, like trying to sing at the same time. Um, so, just question about that then. How does that get judged as far as like y- your grade is concerned? There are there were times where like like let's say we're learning a piece and you know we have maybe a few days to learn it or a week to learn it. Then they would like literally for that whole 45 minutes or whatever that we had of course they would go through every person and we would sing the song or maybe part of the song so that they could hear how we're doing um you know what's working and what's not working or like you know you need to be a little bit louder or you need to sing more like this as opposed to wide or whatever mm-hmm. things like that um and they could see things sometimes or maybe they would separate it by section like there's you know alto one alto two soprano one Mm. soprano two so sometimes we would go section by section um and of course if if you were like really off they would be able to hear that and so they would kind of have to nitpick go row by row to Uh. figure out where the problem is you know so depending on like how the teachers like because some teachers are a little bit more polite about it and they'll be a little bit more understanding that you know we're we are learning this potentially new technique of singing you know a lot of us listen to pop music and stuff or whatever it is Mm. so it's the the way that pop singers sing based on like this is how like classical singers will explain it to you is that like it's a they're singing wide so it's mm-hmm. like i don't know how to i don't know how to explain it but they're singing more wide and like if you think of an opera singer they're singing more like oh as opposed to ah. mm-hmm. so it's like that way of trying to teach us a, a new technique basically um mm-hmm. 
So yeah, I would say they're kind of on top of you about it, but because it's such a big chorus, it kind of teaches you accountability and like you have to be the one to learn this on your own. Um, mm. So I think that's that's one of the good things about chorus, like it gave you a lot of accountability. Um, another class that we took was music theory, which was mm. you know understanding notes and chords and um, different scales and keys and things like that, um, and a little bit of music history as well, which I do not remember most of. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, music theory, I, I wouldn't say that I know how to read perfectly. Like if I were to see something, I can't just play it on hand. But if I like took the time to like review, like what this note is, what this note is, I could probably eventually get it. Mm. And uh, any other classes that stand out besides that you remember? The only other one I could think of that I took, geez, I forgot what it was called, but it was more like solo singing. Like we would, they would give us a classical piece to sing mm -hmm. in front of the class. Um, and it would be a class of maybe like 20 or something. Um, and so the teacher would be playing on the piano and we would be singing to it and it'd probably be like a very classical type of song. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that would be like you, your chance of being in the spotlight in a way, unless you had gotten a solo in you know a performance or something but if you had never never gotten a solo like i had never really gotten a solo then that was kind of me tackling stage fright in a way mm. so that kind of i feel like was my intro to after high school when i actually started to get into doing open mics and like performing and stuff is like oh. i would try to channel not necessarily channel but in order for me to prepare what i'm about to get into is be like it's going to be like that time when you were in class and you had people in front of you and you were singing in front of those people mm. um the main difference is that it's my personal music. And in fact, I felt like more comfortable with my personal music than like some classical piece that I could not relate to oh, for the course. most part, you know? Yeah, because that's like, obviously it's much older. It's been out there since before any of us were mm -hmm. born. So how can you really connect like that unless right. you kind of actually, oh, I like classical, so I'll actually learn it properly. Right, yeah. There's yeah. no uh, bond to it, right? For the most part, yeah. There were, I feel like, so, so every year of high school, we would learn a different like, language of classical music mm. so like the first year i think was italian and then it was the next one was german and then it was french and then senior years when you would do english um, uh. so i guess that's when i kind of started like feeling like i could relate to the music better like even though they they would like translate it for us or tell us what it means like when we were doing the other languages but it's different when you're singing things that are just like they come as breathing you know our, our first language to us comes as breathing and so when we hear it or when we're singing it, we can really connect to it in a way hmm. um, that makes it more a little more special. So it felt like when you become a senior, you feel like you earned that um, connection because all those years you were just like singing what they were assigning you. And even though you're still assigned to the English music, it's like, OK, I can tap into whoever I am when hmm. I sing these words. Um, I don't know if everybody was treating it that way, but because I've hmm. always been connected to lyrics and storytelling, it, it felt like that for me. That was more your path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then after you graduated from there, how did you feel overall about your experience? Like, did you get much from it or did you have to do more like soul searching per se while you were there? I would say both. I would say I did get a lot from it, but there was a lot that I also missed out on. Um, and I feel like because I was always around people, I didn't put enough attention on myself, mm -hmm. um, which is still something that I'm trying to get better at today is like putting more attention on myself and who am I as a person. And so I feel like at the time it was more who am I as an artist and trying to find my sound, like who who do I like that I feel like relates to my sound. A singer that I feel like I found myself singing her one of her songs a lot is Corinne Bailey Ray. I don't know if you know her. I you know what's so funny? <laughs> I saw your hair in one of the pictures when I first started following you and I was like, Corinne Bailey Ray. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we do have some similar yeah. physicality. Well, not to, you know, trivialize it like that. Oh, yeah. But it was like, hmm, damn. I, I, then I remembered her because she was around the time Amy Winehouse when she was first getting right, big. Right. And no one even paid attention to her, even though she had like a really like a songbird, angelic kind of sound to her. Yes. Like yeah. a really sweet tone. Right. And I love this so much because like for me, at least, I don't know how you are like when you work out, you get physical like that. I can't work out to anything like I would actually enjoy like, let's say hip hop, whatever. I got to work out the R&B. I have to mm, work out okay. the pop or I have to work out to like a podcast. Okay. Interesting. I get distracted by like the, you know, everybody's playlist of just metal, this metal, that, whatever. Do you feel like it's just too much like pump to it or like, what do you think it is about it that? I get distracted. I can't do it. Mm, okay. Especially if it's like old school hip hop. I like, I'm like just, you know, 
trying to go in my in my head along to the mm. lyrics instead of just actually like focus okay. on the workout. Interesting. So I feel okay. weird. I could see that. So yeah. I need the softer stuff to kind of like play in the background, like or, or a podcast. I yeah, catch it's up more feelsy than like lyrical, I guess. Yeah, yeah. kind of like in in the vibes per se. Right. I, I see what's that. that? What's the number for the police in here in Los Angeles? Nine one one. Nine one one. Actually, after you left uh, SVA, at least, mm -hmm. and you committed to the music, that's when you finally dropped the first project in 2017. I'm going to say this incorrectly, but forgive me, I'm not French. Une? Un. Un. Yeah. Which is one in yeah. French. Mm -hmm. And un is actually the female conjugation, because it's, it's like un right, right. in French. I'm not French either, by the way. <laughs> but French was the first language I, first foreign language I ever learned. Mm which is like in middle school. I don't have a lot of French memorized, but I don't know. I just always felt a connection to it, probably because it was my first language. And, and I remember in middle school, I was I really wanted to learn Spanish first. Mm. It's more common in New York. Um, and I, I didn't make it into the class in time or something. Not not that I was late. I, I mean, like, you know how you had to apply for classes sometimes? And if, like, you didn't make it, if the other kids got the spot first. Then. You have privilege in that sense because mm. you're younger. And when I went to school... Uh, you were, they would literally put you based on what you look like. So they assume most of the time. But I'm one of those, unfortunately, like when I was little going into middle school, I was one of those, you know, Sabo kids. Like I mm. I grew up with both Spanish parents, but like yeah. not knowing proper Spanish, they just kind of, you know, I know offhandedly taught me. Spanish people like that who don't know Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. But I had to beg in high school for them to put me in Spanish classes because mm. I don't know how to speak it. I don't know how to write or yeah. defend myself in it. You know, God forbid, I'm in a car accident, like and stuck somewhere. Only Spanish people, Spanish speaking EMTs, are like yeah. coming to rescue me or something. And they're expecting you to, <laughs> right? <laughs> Based on your luck. <laughs> exactly. Crazy. So I had to beg for that, but they finally because yeah. the first of uh, my freshman year of high school, I had to do Greek mm -hmm. because I grew up in Queens, like by Astoria. That's so very they assumed, wow. oh, the largest active Greek community outside of Greece. Yes, it's going to be beneficial wow. to all of them learn that Greek. That's like a rare language that I feel like is taught in schools at least i don't know if it's just new york or america in general i feel like you rarely hear greek being taught in schools why would you i mean you know no offense to greece yeah. i was a greece plenty of you know john stamos I, mean, hey, I don't know hebrew and my dad's israeli so there you go he didn't want to teach us he was like you don't need to know this like, <laughs> when are you ever gonna need it <laughs> <laughs> but it would be cool to just like throw it at someone <laughs> like or if someone's like talking shit in hebrew and they think i don't know <laughs> yeah you pull it out it's like yeah you motherfucker right. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would be great yeah so you missed out on Spanish, but you learned French instead. Mm -hmm. But that was, you know, middle school. So how yeah. could you remember all that from back when? Unfortunately, like some of it, like some of the basic rules of it, I get, which is it's similar rules to all the Latin languages. I think Italian and uh, Spanish mm -hmm. have similar like rules to similar French as enough, well. Yeah. yeah. Like even if you think of the word friend, right? Um, ami is French, I think. And then um, amigo, you know, is Spanish. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the Italian one, but I think it's similar to French. But yeah, it's like similar roots and conjugations and things like that. Um, but yeah, anyway, French, yeah. <laughs> right, so that led to Un. Yes. Your debut project, mm -hmm. 12 Tracks, 2017. Mm -hmm. um, looking back on it now, what are we, six years removed from it? Yeah. My it came out right. in January, so it'll be seven. It'll be seven, okay, so January. seven year anniversary. Yeah. So God's number, lucky number. I like seven. Trying to, like uh, time to play some scratching with seven and yes. the time it comes up but uh how do you feel about that now almost seven years since the release of that first one it's it's cool it's cool to think about um i'm glad that i did it even though it was very rough and it was i don't think any of it was recorded in the studio it's just me at home mm. um and produced by myself as well except for one Entirely? that was there was one that was like a, a beat that i found on soundcloud and that's part of the reason why i don't really have it up anymore is because i don't uh, want to you know deal with that not that they came for me i'm not really big like that yet so <laughs> <laughs> they yet. don't even probably don't even know who i am <laughs> um but just to play it safe um but yeah i um i'm really happy that i put that project together because i knew that i just had to do i had to do one before i could do something that would be even better um i'm definitely a perfectionist in a way yeah and i feel like if i had just held on to it until i was like good enough as a producer or singer never or whatever out, right yeah it just never would i would just keep looking and be like no but then it could be this and then it, this could happen it's like yeah fuck it you know so i'm i'm really glad that i put that together because it led me to the next project which i'm very proud of and going back to un yeah 
that was still around the time, if I'm not mistaken, based off notes, that you were still telling people you were a photographer mm -hmm. more than you were an artist. Yeah, it was very hard for me to even tell people that I was a singer or a musician because I, I held such a high standard of music. And I'm like, how dare I call myself a musician? <laughs> I can't, like, I'm not Alicia Keys. Like, I'm not John Legend. Like, I, I don't, I felt like I didn't have what was required of someone who calls themselves a singer or a musician, even if I was you know trained for all those years or whatever like learning in school is one thing but like how you stand out as yourself as an artist or as a musician is another but it wasn't until after a while or, or at least it seems like after you released un yeah you realize no one's perfect and everyone doubts himself at some point eventually so why not just commit already right exactly and own up to who you are what you do what you love and i felt like if i at least said it out loud it would help me to internalize it because mm -hmm. sometimes you have to do that even if like let's say you're a painter and you feel like oh i'm just throwing a brush around throwing colors around whatever if somebody asks me i'm not going to say that i do it because it's just something that i keep to myself but if you at least like say it to someone and then they see you as that something about that allows you to see it in yourself mm. um, depending on the kind of person you are there there are people who are more confident in themselves and so they can kind of like okay. you know but it, I feel like there's those two different kinds of people. There's people who are very confident and they can just like say that they do this thing. And then there's people who kind of have to push it out of themselves. And it's a little bit harder. For right. Us. To fake it till you make a crowd. Basically. Which is the better approach when you think about it. But it's also, you know, they got to throw themselves literally into the lion's pit to like see if they can st even stand. It's interesting chance. to think of what we're really afraid of. What we're afraid of someone being like, no, you're not. You don't do this. Like, you know, but... Yeah, it's interesting to think about now because there's so many ways that you can be this thing. There's so many kinds of musicians. Even if you think about what defines music now, it's like there's so many different kinds of artists that, not to sound cocky, but I'm sure that I'm better than some of the people who are known to be like big music artists. Some? <laughs> Excuse you, come on. <laughs> Please, I've been following you for so long now. Thanks to Brendan, he put me on to your sound. Followed you ever since. And because, you know, obviously it's, it's easy to click and follow a pretty face. But then you get deeper than that and you see that how you sound, which is also one of the things that really took me by surprise because now I'm only now hearing your conversational mm -hmm, voice right. versus your singing voice, yeah. which is really like dragged me into like, I like her sound. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan. Legit. I so, appreciate it. No, of course. I mean, it, it's, well, we'll, you know, we're finally going to get into, you know, the deep dives of uh, four tracks. Mm -hmm. We kind of picked amongst ourselves to go into like that. Yeah. We'll play them too as well and, you know, pull them up on YouTube and God damn it, don't flag me, please. <laughs> but um, I, I hope you don't know I don't about those I don't think I've ever roles. flagged anyone. <laughs> I have no reason to. Wait a minute. You're the one that does it? Oh, God, I got some explaining I need out of someone <laughs> that I had as a past guest that flagged me, I guess. Yikes. I told him I was going to play it too, but okay, whatever. Jeez. Yeah. The tea is hot. Yeah, she is from Brooklyn, so that would explain a lot. Ooh, Territorial. The tea is hotter <laughs> for Brooklyn. <laughs> so you, you were touching upon un, and then mm -hmm. that led eventually to du. Yeah. Hopefully I got that right. I'm pretty Close sure on. that's right. Once again, I'm not French. <laughs> <laughs> du, which was released in 2020. Duh. I remember that I was at one point pronouncing it du, and I think someone corrected me, and they were like, it's de or something like that. Did they do it aggressively or snobby like the French do? It like, was deep typing, so I'll never know. <laughs> 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 but that was in 2020 in yeah. the midst of the pandemic no it was january of 2020 you just missed it right you were just like right i was before right before it. It. right before right before which right. i i don't know why but i feel kind of proud of that because i feel like a lot of people during pandemic were like suddenly like now i have the time to do music everything i meant to do yeah i'm not saying that that doesn't mean you can't uncover a passion of yours but i think that when you're doing something under pressure then it's kind of like did you really want to do that? Is that something that you really associate yourself with? When mm -hmm. something that you're doing because you genuinely want to, um, even when like when you have all the time in the world, then it's, it, I don't know, it just says that like you really wanted that and that's really how you chose to spend your time. And so that was something that I was already doing before pandemic. And I, I kind of think that the things I was talking about in the album was very relevant to what pandemic and quarantine made us feel like it made us feel like we were closed in and like we were like losing ourselves in a way like my song going crazy and just mm -hmm. feeling like you're kind of locked into this space um and you really want to get out and so yeah that was really connected it was connected to a relationship obviously but it felt like what a lot of people were feeling during the pandemic mm, okay so kind of playing to both almost 
Yeah, unintentionally. <laughs> yeah. Unknowingly. Hmm. But it, it allowed me to, when I created the music video, which I did the whole music video in my apartment, it, I felt more connected to the song. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. I apologize. The video was done while the pandemic was going on. Yes. Right, and then the album was like right before it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So after do or the yeah. comes, what was it again? I wrote it down, I swear to God. Oh, the no, singles. The singles, right? No, the next project is called Three, right? Is that going to be Three or are you going to call that's, it yeah, something in, else? Yeah, in January of next year. Okay. Are you going with Three in French or something else? Yeah, so Three in French is Toi. Toi. Yeah. Okay, Toi. Well, that's not, that's when Toi comes out. Mm-hmm. But right now we're dealing with Do and everything leading up to Do, which I did go ahead and pick four. Uh, one from Funny Enough Do, which is going crazy, which you just mentioned just now. Right. Uh, I just realized we could we could just translate it from however Siri does it or Google's version of Siri. Oh, to get the, the let's sound. see how they pronounce it. Um, yeah. Let's see. One, two, three put it back on silent because i'm a good guest all right here we go Dude. 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 all right i guess you were kind of right then all right so all um, right one for me there you go if ever i take up french i can start with two right <laughs> <laughs> so this guy doesn't know what one is <laughs> i just skip i don't believe in one i'm, I'm diverse right. i want two of everything exactly i'm like uh, no enough. one in the arc <laughs> right it's never enough do 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 <laughs> That's uh, a great way to to get your name out there in France. <laughs> I would hope. I don't even know what one is. <laughs> <laughs> I see beyond one. I am the one, but I'm looking right. at you too, so we're all inclusive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going crazy. Um, like you said, that's from Do. Mm-hmm. 2020, you shot that, the video at least, in the midst of the pandemic in yeah. your apartment. Yeah. Uh, really creative, by the way. Thank you. All the shots, all the effects, everything too. But I think... The emphasis on going crazy was definitely in the beat uh, production, I mean to say. Mm, okay. Did you produce that? Or? Yeah, I did. Okay. So the stutter uh, was on purpose? Yeah. The, 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 mm-hmm. To really emphasize the going crazy part? Yes. Yeah. Glitching. Okay. <laughs> the glitching, yeah. Yeah. Because I would feel like, yeah, what you would do going crazy or about to, you start twitching, you can't like yeah. uh, get grip anymore. It's even relevant to like just how technology evolves over time. We're slowly connecting ourselves to technology a little too much. My phone is not leaving my side, notice. <laughs> <laughs> Overload. <laughs> I mean, we're only human and they are a part of us now. Yeah. It's kind of like, at some point, doesn't the phone or whatever's next beyond the phone, if anything, like, uh, what's that thing called? Uh, AR? Whatever. Oh, AI or whatever. Oh, AR is, I'm forgetting the difference. AR is like. No, AR, I think is like that Iron Man thing, like you pop a screen up in the middle of nothing. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's. I think that's what the... um the goggles or whatever are going to be the apple thing yeah that's yeah, coming yeah. up the vision pros or something like that mm-hmm. they're like you know uh, a month worth of rent in brooklyn pretty right. much pretty much for a bear. hope it's worth it <laughs> um, <laughs> on the street with your goggles <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you're not an easy target with that on <laughs> not at all <laughs> but going crazy so was that the one you probably did you do more videos for that project besides going crazy i forget mm-hmm. Did a few. So one going crazy, fanatic was I think fanatic I put out before the project actually that was supposed to be like the single anticipating the project. So fanatic mm-hmm. has a video which is just like a black and white video of me in a space singing the song. It's supposed to be more of like a performance video. Um, and then I also have five a.m. slash useless as another video which um, this videographer named Sherm helped me to record. Um, and that was that was literally about you know when it's 5 a.m and you're like tired and you kind of don't know where you are and like i don't know it's uh, i don't know how to explain it but i don't know if you if there's that hour in the middle of the night where it kind of feels like you're in between two worlds um Hmm, like a void yeah a void and like you you can't sleep but you're tired like that feeling is like terrible yeah Um, that's or like um what was that movie get out like Mm -hmm. when he's in the the sunken place i think was called oh yeah i I think i know what what scene you're talking about yeah yeah kind of like that Similar to that, yeah. I'm sure that that was a lot. I'm not gonna be like that was totally <laughs> where I was. <laughs> got that from me. Right. Oh no, they were I first, so that. I got that from them. <laughs> <laughs> That's my life every day. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, so five a.m. useless, and so it was two songs in one video. Mm. The useless half is useless is about just literally feeling 
like you don't really belong somewhere feel like you're not needed um i feel like in a lot of ways whether it's in like relationships or just in life like i feel i feel like i have to be necessary somewhere like even at a job like i have to feel like oh if you know i, I don't want to get fired i want to have a reason why they're not gonna fire me and i want to do this thing that nobody else is really doing or feel like I'm, I'm doing it better or something. So I always feel like I want to be useful. Mm -hmm. um, but there are moments when I don't. I feel useless. And so that's kind of what that song was alluding to. Okay. So the second one we picked out was Circling, which, congratulations, by the way, 1111 was a year anniversary yeah, since it yeah. released. Yes, thank you. And that's a single. Will that be on the next? Oh, God, I forgot already. Toi. Toi. It's okay. Yeah. That yeah, it'll one. be on that. Okay. That will be on it. Um, and Fastlane will also be on it. Okay. So going back to circling, circling around, mm -hmm. uh, the hook, I believe, if I'm naming it correctly, is the hook I remember in December. Mm -hmm. Well, or I mean, like I guess I think lately I've been more experimental with structuring the songs, but in more basic terms, I guess that would be the hook. Yeah. OK, so I got it right. All right. So shout out to recognize some music folks, <laughs> since I am not talented at all in that sense. I mean, but, you've listened to, uh, I'm sure, a shit ton of music. Yeah, but still, you know, there's always more. There's never enough to get into. Oh, yeah. We'd but, probably go crazy if we heard every song ever created. Going crazy. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> but that stood out to me, that uh, the part of that song. I remember in December, I could weather the storm like I was 17 at first, but then you say like I was 23 after. Mm -hmm. So is there a difference in between that time gap of 17 and 23? Did the... The circling around, come full circle with those two ages, or I think it was just a repetition of falling through the same patterns. Um, you know, going through certain relationships, approaching them in a similar way, um, even if it was a different relationship, and even if I told myself this is going to be different or this mm -hmm. is going to be better, still falling into the same certain traps of like wanting to feel useful again or feeling like I wanted to fit a mold with that person as opposed to just being myself mm. um, and hoping that us being ourselves will create something beautiful even though it might not um, but I didn't want to take that risk of it not being something great and so I would try to mold myself to be how they viewed me or like what I thought their ideal partner would be mm. and so following these falling through these um, circles and patterns that were not healthy basically in when I was 17 and when I was in my 20 early 20s still in my 20s but when I was in my early 20s um and so I in the bridge I'm saying I'm tired of circling and so I need to break this cycle like enough is enough so that's mm. kind of what that song is talking about okay well that is mostly love right until you find the right one as they say or eventually mm -hmm. land the good one yeah but there's still a lot of personal growth that has to happen because yeah. You know, let's let's say you get into a relationship shortly after you just left a different one, and you didn't have that time to heal. Mm -hmm. And that that's can, that can be how you get into those cycles because you didn't have that time to really step back and say what was wrong, what did I, what could I have been better with, what do I need to work on and unpack so that when I get in this whatever the next thing is, I'm not throwing that on the other person. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I'm sure that happens in a lot of relationships. Oh yeah, of course, the never-ending maze of love. Yeah. Or in this case, a circle of love. <laughs> the circle of love it's gonna be the next movie <laughs> <laughs> all right so then next we had fast lane which as you mentioned was a single mm -hmm. already i like the part that says uh i think i'm about to take the fast lane because i need more time to get you off my mind so is that more of you it seems like love seems to be or escaping like love Escapism, past yeah yeah there can be a lot of escapism because like I said, like trying to, in me trying to create um, or be the the good partner to whoever that person is that I'm with, I'm kind of escaping who I really am. Mm -hmm. The things that I really struggle with or the things that I feel like I want to be better with as a person. Um, I'm kind of losing myself in an ideal as opposed to accepting who I am. Um, and it kind of, I don't know, it's like it, it kind of halts the growth or stops the growth of, of myself as a person. Mm. But it is something that I'm like escapism is something that I'm guilty of is like I want to I just want to like feel good in this moment. I just want to like I want things to be good at this moment instead of like having the hard conversations, whether it's with myself uh, or with that person. So it's always like uh, not to say always with you, but it seems like you would rather take the fast. You wouldn't want to take the clean break. You want to take the fastest route out. 
Yeah, because let's say you're like literally stuck in traffic, then you're kind of just sitting there stuck with your own thoughts. And sometimes those aren't good thoughts and you don't really want to be in that mm. headspace. Um, if you're in a fast lane, then you have something to focus on. You can just drive and like watch the signs. By the way, I don't drive. I never learned how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I got a whole song about driving. Well, um, you're but, a morning worker than I am. <laughs> I did have to learn eventually and I got the license. I just don't have the car. Because God forbid the economy nowadays permits it. I know. Like that. It's like, why even learn if you can't even Parking. Have the car? Parking's a big problem. Oh my God. It looks stressful <laughs> as someone who doesn't drive. I am I feel stressed on behalf. Well, funny enough, that's the part I learned easiest, the parallel parking. Everything else kind of I had to adapt to, but I meant parking in the sense of finding a parking spot. Yeah, yeah. Wherever you go now. Forget the city, but I'm sure you in Brooklyn, I'm mm -hmm. in Queens too. It's like, you know, circling, circling, yeah. circling. There you go. <laughs> you could do a remix for like the drivers out there. <laughs> Ooh, circling and fast lane <laughs> in one song. <laughs> that's a cool mashup. Yeah, we could send it over to Geico or one of them. <laughs> That'd be Sponsored cool. You could see, you, yeah, you could have it play in the background, the little gecko going crazy. That would be to a find. hilarious sponsor being that I don't drive. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm circling. Like what, like, what does she know? <laughs> About insurance. Where's your insurance. license? <laughs> right. <laughs> and now we're on break. As yeah. far as the newest bit of sound you got for us, mm -hmm. that's going to be on the project. Yeah. Toi. Yeah, you got it. Toi. Nice. Sweet. And that's the one you sent me of, at least, uh, I'm going to say like a rough demo till now. It's not official yet. or That is it. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, that is the one. That's going to be the version of it. Okay, but it's not out yet? Or... No, it's not out yet. Okay, got it. So exclusively to me mm. as of right now. Yeah, I mean, if, if you want to play on the show, this could be like a little special. Oh, as long as I have your permission. Yeah, you've had, oh, you've great. got it. Oh, great. Consent is important. Yes. 2023. <laughs> that's where we're living in right now. It was always important, but, you know, we talk about it now. <laughs> <laughs> now there's proof of the consent being given it's not right. just implied i'm not you know mansplaining to you give me the rights <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> and don't flag me either. there's been enough people to um to pave the way for us it, it, with their mistakes <laughs> they ran so we can walk exactly <laughs> <laughs> but i like this one a lot too because um again not to compare you or put you like oh you remind me of or you sound just compare like but away. at least the song reminds me so much of like pm dawn I don't know who that is. Um, what was that song? Uh, Memory set upon a bliss or something? Oh, God. I'm always intrigued when people compare me to artists that I haven't even heard of. Well, it's just that one song they had. They had a couple of songs, but they were like sort of kind of one-hit wonders. Okay. They did have a couple of things afterwards, but they were like the early 90s. Um, they sampled um, this song that reminds me of. It sampled um, European rock camp paid in full. Okay. So that beat. Uh, I'll send I know. you a link so yeah, you know what you're talking about. But you're not the first person to compare me to someone I didn't know though, because somebody had compared me to Massive. There's a there's a song by from the group Massive Attack. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Who, I didn't know who this group was, but I think it's from like the '80s. And so they they had put out. Oh, wait, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> not, not not that something we, else. We both failed music theory. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Sorry, I'm living my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. It was... What is her name? She has a song called The First Taste. And... Oh, gotta look this up. Sounds familiar, actually. Oh, gosh. I gotta look this up. Yeah, Fiona Apple. Oh, okay, okay. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. They compared me to Fiona Apple. And I didn't know who she was. And I heard that song and i was like okay this could be something that i would like produce or, or write to so it's interesting i think it's just kind of like an era you know like i mm. think that was maybe early 2000s or something so between 90s and 2000s which is a big part of my inspiration i feel like very connected to to that era mm, okay part of it too which just had that question is is this kind of like a double entendre of music and love kind of holding you back so much that you don't break or no, this was strictly about the relationship I was in and oh. feeling like, even though this is something that I have experienced in other relationships, going back to circling and falling into the same patterns, um, feeling like I'm pushing my limits so that I can, basically just to, to ease the other person, mm. um, which is obviously very unhealthy. Um, yeah. You know, trying to push myself until I hit a breaking point. Um, and the fact that I even know that there's a breaking point and I'm still waiting to hit it is, you know, not not ideal. And so, like, you see it coming, you're anticipating it, and you're just like, ah, let it be. Yeah, I'm kind of hoping that I don't get to that point, but 
in understanding like how this other person is and how my patience is like we're gonna get there mm. um, but because I'm also a very non-confrontational person or at least I try mm. to be um, it, it can go wrong <laughs> and it does I hear that yeah which is always unhealthy to put others before yourself yeah I, I think it's a balance and you need to find somebody who can be considerate of you and you can be considerate of them but you also both have to have a sense of self yeah which is tough to do i get it yeah but it's 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 hard to hear like not so much hard to hear it's surprising to hear like as young as you are a female you know of these days and these times mm -hmm. to like still kind of want to put up with that because not to say it was more common back when or before our time even but it, it was kind of like not even implied it was just kind of like it, it's the way it was yeah the woman puts up with enough if she has to if she breaks or she even shows a crack it's like you know taboo for them to do so yeah and then i, I don't know if the roles really reverse nowadays either but i think it's a little bit more fair playing ground kind of sort of yeah i mean do you feel like more men have a breaking point that they um that they kind of slowly anticipate or do they kind of just like if they don't feel good about something they, they just talk about it or vocalize it or express it i think more men nowadays i would hope are more taught to like vocalize or kind of you know express before they get to that point but yeah. then again like they say oh instead of men breaking down and like you know cracking underneath the pressure they would just like you know beat somebody just yell at them and then yeah. get that load they off weren't that as way. forgiving if like they didn't like something that their partner would do i guess yeah pretty much it's a difficult time yeah know? yeah times are difficult now it, it, look in your wallet and see if you got anything left pretty much these <laughs> days it seems like with inflation Oh, for sure, for sure. Shake. Shake. Pig. Shake. But Asia. Mm-hmm. Eden Adam. Yeah. Do you ever go by Eden at all or just... No, I don't think so. Never, okay. Yeah. When you ever got yelled at or punished, whatever, like, Eden, uh, Asia, Eden, Adam. You would think. Like, I've seen enough movies where that's a thing, but no. I've never been called, like, the full name in in a form of rage or anything like that. Or would your dad play, like, a specific song to know, like, send the mood, like, okay, you're in trouble now, get your ass down here. That would be fun. And is that something that happened in your house? No, I wish. <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> play the song, you already know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> that's your cue, get down here for this whooping. <laughs> wow, what a concept. <laughs> But uh, Asia, though, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate everything you've um, coming out here today to meet with me, to sit down and do this, the, the comeback, the return. You know, it's it's minimal on my end, but more importantly, I just wanted to make this happen. You know, uh, uh, just know that I'm proud to be a fan of yours, of your work, everything you've done till now. Definitely can be posted when you've got, you know, shows coming up. I'm, I'm hoping you'll do enough to promote this next project coming out, Twa. And Definitely, yeah. I'll have to, you know, do it just so I can remember three in front. I got do so far, but I need three and it just, you know, work up to ten, yeah, hopefully. Every chart, every chapter of my life, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, everything but, um, will be, uh, I'll talk about whatever else I'm putting out and like it'll be on my social media. Um, so my Instagram is aja.adam, Asia Adam. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, from there you'll see all my other links, but I also do have a website, which is just my name, asiaadam.com. So. Awesome. You can find her there, and please do so. I beg of you. I wouldn't have her on here if I didn't mean it when I say, you know, well-deserved. And thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Hopefully, we'll be able to link up again. We got new projects, new stuff coming out. For sure, yeah. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you till then. And then, you know, click somewhere, I don't know, above me, preferably below me, I don't know, <laughs> uh, to, to find out myself, too. Yo, it's over. All right? It's over. It's over. Yeah. Move the mic. Move the mic. Thank you. All right.